a simple question. Why is it important in your view to think about global justice today? Well, I think the uh, impetus to think about global justice has arisen because we see our world now as increasingly interdependent. And I think that uh, this is also seen by people who are at the, the bottom end of it, so that the kinds of inequalities that exist in the world today and the way in which those inequalities are created by the impact of uh, the richer states, I think uh, are brought to people's attention. And so once that becomes seen, then I think you have to start thinking about questions of global justice. People want to know why are these differences legitimate? Uh, how do we know when the impact of one society on another is acceptable and when it's not? And so we, we, we start talking about global justice. Mm -hmm. And but you say in one of your books, in, uh, in your uh, latest book, as a matter of fact, entitled uh, National Responsibility and Global Justice, you say that it's a, it's a very new field and a very new area of uh, inquiry. I mean, it, it has, what, 20 years? It started 20 years ago, 30 years ago, more or less? Yes, I think that's right. I mean, the concept itself, I mean, people obviously, um, for many years before that, were talking about issues about development and about international law and so on and so forth. But I think the idea of global justice itself is, is relatively new, and I think it reflects a changed perception of the way the world is on the part of both rich and poor. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so just to start with the beginning, I mean, what would be your definition of justice, and how would you distinguish global justice compared to international justice and to national justice? Because clearly there are similarities, but probably also you know, significant differences. Yes. Well, I don't think it's hard to give um, a simple definition of justice that captures all of these dimensions. Obviously, it's about what people can claim from each other as a matter of right. And uh, we have these different levels. I mean, I suppose one way to think about it is to say that uh, social justice, an old idea, well, at least a century old, is about justice as between citizens, citizens of the same state, about what they owe to each other, about how their institutions should be established so that it, they achieve the kinds of claims that citizens can, can make on each other. Now, if you talk about international justice, which I suppose was talked about uh, in the middle part of the century, that, I think, is mainly about relations between states. So it covers yeah. issues that arise, for example, in international law about the things that states can and can't do to each other, about uh, the, the rules they must obey, about the treaties and so on that they must keep. And then I think we start to think about uh, global justice when we ask the question, what do human beings in general owe each other as a matter of justice? So we start thinking about human beings just as individuals, mm -hmm. and we ask about the claims they can make on each other and how we can respond to those claims. So that's a new perspective that I think goes beyond the, the first two. Yeah, and, and precisely in, in your work, I mean, you, you argue that uh, most philosophers uh, writing today on global justice describe themselves as uh, cosmopolitan in a way. You know, it makes sense to think about uh, oneself as a, as a cosmopolitan if you're going to argue about global justice. So, but it doesn't, be, doesn't seem to be your case. Yes. Um, I, I find the cosmopolitan label uh, rather confusing. It's a very vague term. I'm not sure that it signals very much other than a sort of general concern for global questions. So I've tried not to define myself either as a, a cosmopolitan or an anti-cosmopolitan, though some people I think would regard me as an anti-cosmopolitan. I think the, the real issues arise once you begin trying to define these terms more carefully, and then some differences really do begin to emerge. But the label mm -hmm. itself, I don't think, is so important. Mm -hmm. but, but precisely in, in your work, you, as a way to bring clarity to this uh, confusing and confused notion, you, you distinguish between uh, what you call uh, strong and, and weak cosmopolitanism and then moral and political cosmopolitanism. So can you tell us a bit more about this distinction? Yes, we should probably take them in reverse order, I think. Uh, ah. We take moral and political first. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, I think, relatively straightforward. I mean, a, a moral cosmopolitan is somebody who holds a certain view about uh, our ethical relations to other human beings and the extent to which we owe them certain kinds of obligations and so on, regardless of national borders, just by virtue of their humanity. That's an ethical view. Uh, political cosmopolitans are those who think that we need to have political institutions at global levels. 
at the, the most extreme form is those who think that there should be a single world state. But I think often uh, political cosmopolitans include those who want to argue for something a bit less than a world state. But certainly some institutions with authority, political institutions, uh, operating above national level and at global level. So I think that's the difference there. Now, if you come on to the um, issue about strong and weak cosmopolitanism, I think this, this is a distinction within the, uh, the ethical uh, cosmopolitan view. Yeah. And that's a little bit harder to pin down, but I think it's something like this. It's the difference really between the view, which is the, the weak view, that all human beings have to be considered from an ethical point of view. In other words, <laughs> when we make decisions, whether as individuals or as collectives of states, we must always consider the impact of what we're doing on everybody. We can't just leave the whole section of humanity and say they don't matter. That's the weak view. We just have to consider them. The strong view says we have to consider them equally. We have to give equal weight to their rights, equal weight to their interests, as we give to those people who are closer to us, our fellow nationals. So it's, the, the strong view says there must, be no, there must be no distinctions. We must treat everybody in exactly the same way. So that's the difference, mm -hmm. I think. And, and, that's the, and uh, so uh, keeping in mind these distinctions, what would be the position that you would embrace? I mean, uh, I, I would tend to think that your position is more on the weak cosmopolitan side, right? Yes, exactly. I, I would su support um, weak cosmopolitanism and rebut strong. Mm -hmm. and, and so precisely, what would be the, the, the principles, the, the normative principles which would be at the core of uh, uh, you embracing this notion of weak cosmopolitanism? You know, if you had to, to give us a list. Uh, oh, right, okay. Well, yes. uh, I mean, I think the, 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 most, the central idea is that there is something that we owe to all human beings, and it's probably best, in my view, captured by the notion of human rights. Mm -hmm. So every human being is entitled to have their human rights protected. But it doesn't follow, of course, that we have equally strong reasons to protect the human rights of everybody. In other words, mm -hmm. we have special responsibilities to protect the human rights of those who are in various ways close to us, related to us in various ways. But we have some reason to respond mm -hmm. to everybody's human rights, and that's that's mm -hmm. the important. That's that's the kind of view that I would defend. Yeah. yeah so, so in this context, I mean, it seems to me that much of your thinking on global justice is about uh, examining ex examining the, the the tensions between the national demands of justice and and uh, the, the the global demands of justice and, and drawing the line. And, and one of the key points that you, many, that you make in your work is that clearly, uh, you know, we, we owe something special to our fellow citizens. So first of all, how do you draw the line between the demands coming from the global and the demands coming from the national? And, and why is it that we, we owe uh, something special to our fellow citizens? I mean, what is the normative foundation for your claim in terms of uh, special yes. duties towards uh, our fellow citizens? Yes, what I think is distinctive about the justice that we owe to the, our fellow citizens is that it uh, characteristically is comparative and often egalitarian. What I mean is that we owe uh, than various kinds of equal treatment or, if you like, to create certain relations of equality among fellow citizens. I mean, the most obvious case, I suppose, would be a notion like equality of opportunity, mm -hmm. where we think that it's a requirement of, of social justice, that our education system, our legal system and so on are all organized in such a way that, as far as possible, people have equal opportunities in the sense that made familiar by philosophers like Rawls. So mm -hmm. there's a sort of comparative aspect to uh, our duties of justice to fellow citizens that I don't think is present when we think about our, du our global duties. They're, they're best understood uh, in terms of a, a kind of global minimum that everybody is entitled to, as I said, perhaps best understood in terms of human rights. But mm -hmm. there is no requirement to create or introduce global forms of equality, as mm -hmm. there is in the domestic case. Mm -hmm. Now, you asked about what the, uh, the, the basis for this was. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's an interesting question, not an easy one. I think there are sort of two. So it's, it's, it's something to do with the relationships that exist between us 
at national level. And mm -hmm. that, I think, is partly a matter of sharing an identity mm -hmm. and partly a matter of engaging in various kinds of reciprocal practices, practices of mutual aid and so on, with our fellow mm -hmm. citizens. So it's those two things, I think, together that explain why we have these special mm -hmm. obligations that we don't owe to people yeah. globally. Yeah, and and so so in your view, it doesn't have to do with scarcity of resources, or it doesn't have to to do with issues of allocation of resources, which we cannot expand beyond the national level, or uh, it doesn't have to do with uh, taxation and so on. It's really the key has to do with sharing of an identity and engaging in reciprocal practices. Yes, yes. I don't think the. I mean, the, of course, the resource questions and so on are, are important when it comes to implementing ideas of justice. But I think at the, at the foundational level, they aren't the key. I mean, we could, we could feasibly, um, for example, engage in a lot more uh, global redistribution if we thought that was a matter of justice, and some, of course, it is. But uh, the underlying issue is really what, what, what we owe to people. Mm -hmm. That's the underlying but, question. Yeah, but so see, if yeah. these two notions are at the core of your thinking about uh, special duties being owed to our fellow citizens, sharing of identity and engaging in reciprocal practices, of course the world is being, we are told, more and more globalized. So if this uh, sense of identity and this sense of engagement is evolving and is widening and is deepening at the wide level, does it mean that somehow your, your position on these issues would have to change? Yes, I, I'm perfectly willing to accept that. I mean, I, I have a general view about, about justice, that it evolves in, in line with our, 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 our practices and our relationships. So when these change, then we begin to think about new forms of justice. So if it were the case that the world as a whole began to look very like uh, a nation state now does, mm -hmm. it would be a very big change, of course. But if that was to be the case, then, of course, um, everything I'm now saying would apply then to the global level. So it is really a, ma a contingent matter. And of course, it, it becomes complicated in cases, for example, like the um, European Union, which begins yeah. to take on some of the features of a, of, a, of a nation state, not all of them. And I think there we have to begin to think about uh, the special kinds of justice that emerge in that sort of context. Mm -hmm. but, but precisely, do you feel that somehow these, uh, these trends, uh, which we are told have been with us uh, for, for now three decades in terms of globalization, do you think that somehow they are, uh, they are changing a bit the landscape in the context of which uh, we, we are thinking about this distinction between what is owed to the national and what is owed to the global? I mean, some people are making the argument, but do you think that we are witnessing such a trend which little by little will, will force us to somehow revisit this idea of special duty to the national and, and uh, other duties to the global? I don't think that the forms of globalization that exist at the moment would force us to have that rethink. I mean, we've, in a sense, by talking about global justice at all, we, we've engaged in a rethink. That, yeah. I suppose, is my yeah. opening kind of point. So the, the, I mean, economic globalization, the fact that economies are becoming more interdependent, for example, uh, that's what in, partly inspires thinking about global justice at all. I'm not, I think, convinced that some people think that um, national identities are fast disappearing, being replaced by global ones. I'm much less convinced that's happening. I think partly because of the big cultural cleavages that still exist in the world today, which I think act as very strong barriers against the emergence of a single global identity. Yes. So, so clearly you think that uh, this kind of distinction is going to continue to remain relevant and significant. So then in terms of the respective uh, duties uh, at the national level and the global level, so, so in your view, what are the, the, the things, uh, the specific things that we owe to our uh, fellow citizens in this kind of globalized and yet still nationally anchored world? What Which I think are specific? The, uh, Yes, the, the, what we owe to our, I mean, what we owe our fellow citizens, I think, are the traditionally conceived uh, duties of social justice. So, it's, you know, questions like um, equality before the law, equality of opportunity, providing people with a, a generous minimum of healthcare and education, and so on. These these are familiar um, familiar ideas. I think the uh, the more difficult, and in some ways more interesting now, issue is 
how to conceptualize uh, global justice. Yeah. And uh, we've talked already a bit about the idea of the um, protection of human rights. Uh, that, I think, is probably the number one demand, but it doesn't exhaust the uh, idea of, of, of global justice. And I think I'd add two other ideas to that. Uh, one is what I'd call um, fair terms of interaction. In other words, when mm -hmm. societies interact, when states interact, they, I think that now is much more required of them than just that they should adhere to uh, international law. So, for example, uh, questions about the fairness of trade, the rules that govern trade and investment, and also, of course, questions about um, resource use, resource depletion, about mm -hmm. issues like global warming and so on. In all of these areas, what we need are actually principles to allocate fairly the costs and benefits of interaction. In all these mm -hmm. cases, societies are interacting. There are either they're, they're producing benefits or else they're preventing global harms of various sorts, as in the case yeah. of global warming. And then there's a question about how these should be shared between the societies. And this is what mm -hmm. I call uh, fair terms of interaction. Mm -hmm. And I'd add one further principle, which I think is also important, um, because it ties in with some things I believe about global justice. We, we, we attach a lot of value to uh, national self-determination, I think. We, we want mm -hmm. to be in the, in the situation where we can decide many things for ourselves and our national societies. But then I think if you think about it globally, you have to say, well, that's, that, that right of self-determination is one that every society should enjoy. And so mm -hmm. we, I think, owe it to other societies to provide them with the conditions under which they can meaningf meaningfully exercise uh, self-determination. And that, I think, has some implications for resource distribution and so on, mm -hmm. for the, the, the terms of interaction and so on. So that's mm -hmm. a further requirement. So, so uh, these three principles would be the, 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 at the core of uh, uh, what, you en what you envision in terms of what we owe to, uh, you know, strangers beyond borders at the global level. So let's yes. take one after the other. First of all, protection of human rights. So then, of course, yes. the question yes. is, how far should we go about this? I mean, is it enough to somehow uh, engineer uh, norms at the global level? Uh, but then how do we make sure that we implement them? And how do we make sure that we enforce them? So how do we go about this, for instance, in the context of uh, uh, humanitarian interventions? I mean, in the 90s, uh, it was clearly at least in the West, in the name of human rights that we got in, to intervene in, in, in the Balkans and so on. So how far should we go about uh, the protection of human rights at the global level? Is it enough to simply generate norms, or should we go beyond this? It, well, um, it, no, it's, it's, it, it's more than that. I mean, um, there were some uh, situations, perhaps rather extreme situations, in which uh, people's human rights are directly threatened. Uh, th these would include, of course, natural disasters, in my view. But also, I think, uh, some of the situations to which humanitarian intervention is a response. Mm -hmm. So although, I mean, my general view is that the uh, protection of human rights is, the, in the first place, the business of the state of which any person is a citizen, it's mm -hmm. clear that in the, the world today that doesn't always work out. And then, of course, uh, various forms of intervention including uh, humanitarian intervention, uh, are going to be called for. Mm -hmm. So I think then we have a, um, uh, a problem, which, which is, which is uh, uh, the, the problem, I think, is to decide how extensive the responsibility yeah. is. And that's a very yeah. difficult issue, because um, sometimes I think people think that uh, protecting human rights of outsiders is just a matter of everybody in a society making a small sacrifice, paying a few pounds or something of this kind to protect human rights. Mm -hmm. But actually, um, in reality, I think very often what it involves is a small number of people making quite a large sacrifice. So yeah. if you, if you mm -hmm. have an intervention, then soldiers, aid workers, so on and so on, may be exposed to quite a lot of risk. So I think there is a, a real issue about the how to understand the responsibilities that correspond mm -hmm. to human rights, and that's one of the big questions. Mm 
Yeah. And, and, and how do you uh, dovetail in a satisfactory fashion uh, uh, an active protection of human rights in the context of uh, uh, humanitarian intervention and the third principle, which is about uh, national self-determination? How, how do you assess that uh, a given situation uh, is, 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 is bad enough to, to justify intervention and in such a way that it doesn't go against your third principle of right. national self-determination? Well, I think in some of these cases, of course, it's going to vary. I mean, um, in natural disaster cases, I think we can assume that the, uh, the state that's being helped is quite happy to receive the help, mm -hmm. so there's no issue there. In some of the other cases, of course, it, may, it may, be, may be true that there is no real opportunity for genuine self-determination. I mean, if a society breaks down, it falls into sort of conflict, civil war, something of this kind, Mm -hmm. then I think what national self-determination means is, becomes very unclear. So m part of what you may be doing uh, in, in, in intervening is actually recreating the situation in which self-determination is possible. I think that's, mm -hmm. the, that's often the case. So I don't see there being a, um, a big issue here. I mean, of course, it would be, there would be an issue if... Um, uh, uh, intervention was undertaken to protect human rights against the express wishes of a national government, and that, of course, would be a more difficult case. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of the second uh, principle, what you call fair tra fa fairer tra ta terms, terms of, of international trade, so, so if you are talking about fairer, it means that for the moment it's not that, uh, that great. So, so what, yeah. what would be the, 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 the principles which would make the situation better? Uh, and, and how would you go about somehow putting in place these principles? Because it's always a challenge, you know, somehow uh, identifying the principles and then making sure that, you know, we're going to have the institutions, the mechanisms are going to be more faithful. Yeah to these principles. Yes. So what would be the principles and then what would be your <laughs> recommendation in, in order to make it happen? I mean, these are tough questions. Yes, yeah, these are tough questions. I think uh, a good theory of fair trade is something we badly need. And I think it's going to be a complicated theory because it's going to have, I think, at least the following three components. I mean, first of all, there must be some kind of uh, formal procedural equality in the sense that societies are treated equally. So that's, uh, mm -hmm. that already, I think, is, is acknowledged in, in trade negotiations. Um, but I think it has to go beyond that. And the two ways it has to go beyond that are, first, that when societies are interacting in general for their mutual benefit, and that includes trade, there should be a fair distribution of the surplus between them. And that, broadly speaking, to me means an equal distribution. So mm -hmm. trade in some broad sense, it's very hard to make this precise, should be equal, equally beneficial to both of the trading partners. Mm -hmm. Now even if we just stick with a very rough notion of equality there, I think that it's clear that um, existing trade patterns fall very badly foul of that and they're very one-sided. Almost all the benefit often accrues to rich countries and very little mm -hmm. to poor countries. So we can say there's a a substantive uh, fairness issue there. And I think I'd add, add in a third requirement, which is that trade should be respectful of human rights. So mm -hmm. uh, trade that's conducted in such a way that, for example, the, um, the producers of primary commodities are not uh, given their human rights, I think uh, would, would fall foul of this. So I think, I think a human rights agenda should be built into uh, the trade agenda as well. So that would be a way in which uh, we could make terms of interaction fairer. Mm -hmm. and, and you feel that for the moment we are very far away from, from such a situation? Yes, I think we are. I mean, I'm not an expert on, on this. Uh, it's not my main field. But uh, it seems to me that uh, for reasons that are too familiar, um, when trade rules are set, they're very much set in the interests of the richer societies. Mm -hmm. So. Now we assume that you have made the case for, for, better, for better terms of trade. So how do we go about yeah. convincing people who are in charge uh, of uh, policy making, who are in, in political uh, leadership positions, how do we convince them that somehow uh, we have to improve the situation? Because this is always a, a complicated matter. Yes. I mean, okay, to some extent the argument is an ethical argument. It's an argument, I mean, I think that the... Um, <laughs> 
the uh, notion of human rights has gained uh, widespread uh, legitimacy. So I think that is not a hard argument to make. I think um, otherwise, of course, you have to some extent to argue that it's in the longer term interest, even of people in rich countries, mm -hmm. not to have a world in which there are millions of poor people. I mean, the, a world of millions of poor people is going to be an unstable world. It's going to create huge pressures for uh, migration. It's going to produce the circumstances in which, for example, terrorism flourishes. So I think it may be possible, alongside the ethical argument, to yes. make arguments of a more prudential kind for why mm -hmm. actually a fairer world is um, beneficial even to, to people who are living in rich countries. Mm -hmm. How do you explain then that, uh, and I, I agree with you, I mean, clearly uh, the ethical dimension, the ethical argument has, uh, has, uh, has also a prudential dimension which, also, which only makes it more important to, 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 to take it into account, but how do you explain the fact that uh, somehow uh, people in charge seem to be deaf? They don't want to listen and they don't want to really take into account this, this argument. Well, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of persuading to do. I mean, I think there's to some extent um, persuading of domestic electorates to do. I think mm -hmm. uh, people have to understand that um, uh, there are these, these, these global duties and uh, that they may therefore have to make small changes to the way they live and so on to, to fulfill mm -hmm. them. So I think there's an argument that has to be made. I, th I think... Um, uh, politicians may be, we, often we're very negative about politicians, but I think they do feel to some extent constrained by uh, domestic electorates, and so mm -hmm. there we can try and persuade people that these are duties that they must fulfill. But I would imagine that in times of crisis, and in times of economic crisis, as it is the case today, you know, in, in, in the US, in Europe, it's even more difficult to have, to have this argument being heard. I mean, you know, clearly in times of crisis, people are focusing on their own fate, and they're not necessarily uh, eager to, to be open to ethical arguments beyond their own fate. <laughs> yes. I think, um, I mean, one, I think, uh, good rhetorical strategy, actually, is to uh, try to link together people's sense of, uh, of national pride with these issues of global justice. So if a politician can argue that, actually, it's an honorable thing to do for mm -hmm. a nation to, for example, commit to a certain level of uh, foreign aid, or mm -hmm. to commit to uh, uh, lobbying for fair trade practices. And this is something that, you know, it's, it's a matter of national pride that we should do this. And sometimes, actually, um, even people, including our current prime minister, do make arguments of this kind. And I think it's quite a heartening thing to see. Yes. And that, I think, is the kind of argument that has to be made. Yeah. So you, you, you feel that not all hope is, is lost. We I'm always optimistic about this. I, I, yes. I think uh, once people understand um, the issues, and I think, for example, that the, um, the, the fair trade movement is very, very good from that respect. I think people understand the arguments there, and I think one has to work from that. Mm -hmm. and, and then we have the, 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 your, your third principle, which is about national self-determination as, as one of the guidelines for, 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 for yes. global justice in a world which is not uh, a cosmopolitan world because you you don't really identify with this position. So yes, uh, yes. Uh, how do you go about uh, making this principle of uh, national self-determination operational? I mean, uh, you know, for instance, we had the, the, the Balkans in the 90s, you know, and then out of this, uh, out of former Yugoslavia, out of the Federation of Yugoslavia, we ended up having six or seven countries. So how do you decide that it's time for a country to split up and so on? I mean... Yes. This is this is this is difficult. I mean, uh, of course, there are there are there are going to be simple cases where, um, as in the case of um, the ending of colonialism, yeah. where it's clear yeah. that you have a national society and that it's ready for self-determination and so on. Of course, the more difficult cases are, are cases where um, state borders and national borders don't coincide perfectly. You have uh, two communities living side by side, for example, or perhaps there's some overlap in territory. Mm -hmm. And I think there you have to be, uh, you, you can't just, as it were, assume that the classic nation-state arrangement is always going to yeah. be the best one. You often have to have uh, more complicated kinds of arrangements with partial self-determination for regions and so mm -hmm. on, forms of devolution, forms of 
federalism and so on. So the, there can be different ways of achieving self-determination mm -hmm. besides the, cla the classic nation-state form. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and so this, uh, these three principles are really at the core of your vision of global justice, but uh, uh, clearly uh, they, they don't amount to, uh, uh, to uh, egalit egalitarianism, because you, uh, one of the yes. arguments that you make in your book is that, in fact, uh, um, uh, global, uh, what you call global egalitarianism is not the answer uh, for global justice. Uh, yeah. Specifically, you argue that people everywhere should not be made equal in certain, in certain material respect. So, so, more specifically, so what is your argument about uh, uh, egalitarianism and the fact that it is not the answer? Right. Well, I have two, I think, uh, two main arguments about this. Um, I mean, one argument asks the old question, equality of what? I mean, if we're going to make people equal, in what respects? And I suppose what I think here is that in a culturally plural world with different cultures, mm -hmm. it may be quite difficult to find any single uh, currency that would actually make sense to use as a, as a currency of global equality. So um, we often use crude um, monetary uh, uh, um, use, use money as the kind of way to, to determine equality. But actually, of course, that's not necessarily the main thing. I mean, if you think of all the components that go into making somebody's life better or worse, I mean, they're really mm -hmm. quite diverse. They include various kinds of public services, health, education, uh, resources of various kinds, cultural resources, and so on. So, and my, I suppose my central point is that people in different places will mm -hmm. attach different values to these things. We mm -hmm. can't just amalgamate them all together in a, in a, in a, in a single index. Mm -hmm. So um, in one place, you know, for example, um, religious opportunities, opportunities to engage and participate in religion may be very important, and somewhere else it may be sport or it may be music, and one can't assume that one of these is more important than the other. So then mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a real question globally about how to uh, conceptualize equality. But the other argument's rather different, and I think it goes back to national self-determination. And here what uh, I'd want to argue is that um, people make choices. I mean, collectively, they make choices about how their society is going to develop. Mm -hmm. And in broad terms, it's fair that they should uh, bear the results of those choices. So mm -hmm. they make, um, they decide, for example, to, uh, to opt for intensive economic growth, and therefore they, they achieve very high growth rates it's quite reasonable that they should be richer. And if, on the other mm -hmm. hand, they decide that uh, you know, economic wealth is not so important, they want to concentrate on creating, for example, a very rich environment or to, be, to, to preserve natural features and so on, and so they decide on a much uh, slower growth path, then that's also mm -hmm. perfectly acceptable. So if that happens, you're not going to preserve um, equality on any particular dimension over time. Mm -hmm. It's just a corollary of, of self-determination. Mm -hmm. And of the notion of responsibility, after all, people are responsible yes. uh, of, of the world that they, that they make or do not make for themselves. Yes, that's right, but yes. And it, I think that's uh, an important principle. No, 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 absolutely. Yeah. But then how do you argue about responsibility and taking you know, uh, responsibility for who you are, for what you do, and, 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 and for the fact that you fail to succeed in a world which, uh, as you said earlier, is not necessarily a fair world? I mean, for instance, if, yes. you are, if you are a committed uh, political leader in a, in a developing world uh, and you really want to improve the fate of your fellow citizens, the overall fate of your country, and yet you are uh, encountering this lack of fair terms, fair terms of trade. So how do you go yes. about uh, um, inhabiting and being inhabited by a sense of responsibility? How do you go yes. about this? Right. Well, it's, it's, I a, mean, tough it's, it's, it's a tough it's, question. It's not, I mean, it's, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 it's rare. I think it's rarely the case that, um, though it does happen, of course, that a country is so surrounded by intractable, intractable problems mm -hmm. that there is no scope for responsibility at all. It could happen, but it's un unusual. It's unusual. So you, normally, um, the uh, the fate of any particular country is going to be a mixture of uh, responsibility and also. <laughs> circumstances and starting position, which, as you say, may well be unfair. So it's not an argument for saying that 
whatever happens in today's world is, is fine because people are responsible. Uh, it is an argument for saying that where it's clear the responsibility does apply, okay. mm -hmm. uh, then we should not try to, for example, correct for the, for the effects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but what about situations in which you, you encounter uh, situations of limited responsibility? So, how do you go about, uh, you know, uh, inequalities uh, uh, from which a country and from which people suffer and uh, for which they are not entirely responsible? So, how do you go about, first of all, how do you argue about this in philosophical terms and how do you try yes. to redress uh, the situation in, in economic and political terms? Right, yes. Well, I think it's, it can be helpful, I mean, um, to think of responsibility as responding to two dimensions, which you might call um, constraint and control. So mm -hmm. the first, take, take control first. The first condition is that the people in a country are actually in control of what their government does, um, that the, the government beh behaves in a way that's responsive to the interests, the beliefs, and so on of the people. That's obviously most easily achieved where the form of government is democratic. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't want to say that responsibility only obtains in, in democracies. I think there can be cases where a government is responsive because it shares very widely held cultural beliefs, for example, and uh, there are various mechanisms of accountability in the, in the society. So it's not just democracies, but democracy is the clearest case. So that's the control condition. People must be in some sense in charge of their own destiny. The other is the constraint condition where the issue is uh, what room for maneuver have they got? I mean, if they're in fact a very poor country, if they're heavily indebted, if they're uh, under various kinds of, uh, you know, the IMF is issuing various kinds of injunctions to them, there may be very little room for maneuver. In that case, again, of course, uh, responsibility is not going to be achievable. So it's going to depend on those two conditions. But for example, let's take, a, take um, uh, one, one, one sort of uh, very obvious example. I mean, take, take the current situation in Iceland. I mean, I'm yes. mm -hmm. admiration for the Icelanders. I mean, um, so they've suffered a, a huge economic collapse, but it's partly the result of embarking on a certain kind of course of action, which in hindsight, I think the Icelanders would say was fairly foolish. So it's mm -hmm. now up to them, in a sense, to, to reposition themselves, to sort themselves out. I don't think anybody would think that we, all, we owe um, Icelanders special forms of aid because they decided to in, invest very heavily in certain kinds of banking services. That was their decision. They're a, very much a democratic society. So there, I think, responsibility would apply. Mm -hmm. It's a very clear, easy case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, the other so, end so. of the spectrum, yes, yeah. yeah. No, no, go ahead, yeah. sir. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, at the other end of the spectrum, um, if you take a, a case like Somalia or Sudan or something like this, it's very hard to see how responsibility conditions would, have, would apply there. Mm -hmm. So at the very center of your theory of justice at the national level and at the global level is in fact the notion of responsibility, the notion of uh, agency. Yes, yes. that's right, yes. 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 And, and, and because in fact you, 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 the, the, the last thing that you would want is to really have uh, uh, a theory of justice being uh, connected with uh, 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 a sense of victimhood. You, 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 yes. you, you want to really have at the very core of a, of a theory of justice a full-fledged uh, individual agent. Exactly, exactly. Yes, that's very important. Um, and I think it's a, a serious fault with much thinking about global justice that it tends to uh, assume just what you've described, a kind of uh, a sort of victimhood conception of the people who are poor. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I think one also, always has to have the, both the perspectives in mind. One always must see very poor people as in need of help, but also potentially always as responsible agents. So the, uh, the imperative is actually to put them in a position where they can act on that uh, potential. They can become indeed fully responsible agents. That, I think, is the, is the aim. Yeah, and in fact, you seem to say in your work that in fact uh, it, it is uh, so important this notion of responsibility that short of having it, in fact, there is no human dignity. Yes, I think that's true. Yes, mm -hmm. that's very important. Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. And precisely, you know, uh, regarding this notion of responsibility, you 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 distinguish two forms of responsibilities: what you call outcome responsibility and 
remit your responsibility as a way to structure your argument at the global level. So what do you mean by these two types of responsibilities, and, and what is the respective uh, impact uh, on a theory of justice at, at the global level? Right. Well, I, what I call out, yes, outcome responsibility is uh, whether it's individuals or whether it's groups, collectives, nations, is the, the responsibility you have as an agent for the results of your action. So if you act in a certain way, your action has, a, has, a, has an outcome, and that's not just an accidental outcome, but it's one that you either intended or at least should have foreseen, mm -hmm. then the notion is that you should bear that outcome. If it's beneficial to you, you should reap the reward. If it's harmful, you, you have to bear that too. And if it affects somebody else, then of course you have to uh, uh, respond appropriately to that other person. So that's the, mm -hmm. the agency idea. And the second idea, which is a very different idea, um, is to look at cases in which uh, people are, are in situations of need or being harmed in some way or victims of injustice. And there what we're doing is, uh, so they, they're not in the position where they can actually uh, achieve agent responsibility. And then our question is, and who else is responsible for putting that right? And that's the mm -hmm. notion of remedial responsibility. Now, of course, mm -hmm. sometimes the two things go together, because if you if you act in a certain way that harms somebody else, then mm -hmm. very often you're the one who bears the remedial responsibility. So if I knock you over, then I should yeah. pick you up. That's the, mm -hmm. the case where they come together. But mm -hmm. in other situations, of course, well, there may be no, there may be nobody with outcome responsibility. For example, and, and it's an actual disaster. Yes. No, 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 of course. Yeah. And another yeah. aspect yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, of this uh, notion of responsibility, which you are developing both mm. for individuals and for countries, is uh, the notion of, of national responsibility, which applies both yes. to the present and perhaps uh, mod in a more difficult way to the past. Yes. So, you know, and, and clearly here, once again, in line with the sense of agency and so on, you, you feel that uh, nations have a sense of responsibility not only to the present, but also to the past. So yes, I do. Yeah, so, so t tell us a bit about your, your, your thinking on this and, and how do you go about uh, uh, the, the practical implications uh, of this philosophical statement in terms of uh, you know, colonization, for instance. Uh, uh, in Europe, we, we, we have had this debate in the past years. I mean, are we yes. responsible for the past? And what should we do about this? And I don't know how it is in the UK, but in France, yes. clearly, uh, <laughs> the positions are, uh, I mean, the debates are heated. So tell us a bit about uh, yes. this sense of responsibility of the nation towards the present and the past, and in concrete cases, what should we do? Right. The, the, the practical implications are, are, are tricky, but the, I think the principle is, is relatively clear. So the, we start from the point that, that nations are historically extended communities. Isn't it? They're not just formed in one generation, but, but people see themselves. What it means to belong to a nation is to see yourself as belonging to a community that stretches back in time. I mean, often uh, back to the realm of myth, actually, but certainly back over several centuries. That's how nations understand themselves. So by doing that, we identify ourselves with people who, who've come before. And of course, we also, in many material ways, benefit from our membership. So we, we're the inheritors of all kinds of mm -hmm. resources, uh, you know, built environment, uh, stock of human capital and so on and so on. So we're hugely benefited by, by membership. And so I suppose the argument then is that by virtue of both the identity and the benefit, if it turns out to be the case that in the past uh, the nation we belong to has acted in harmful ways towards others, and if that harm persists, if we can actually trace it down to the present, then I think in principle at least we do owe uh, compensatory mm -hmm. responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, why it's a practically diff difficult issue is that there's often argument first about what actually happened in the past, what its significance was, and then there's another argument about how far that's, that's persisted up to the present. And those, those are difficult questions. So um, it's not a simple, I think, matter of translating the general idea into, into, into concrete cases. Yeah, it's, it's a very difficult question, which is you know, uh, part of the debate in Europe, but also in the U.S. and, and so on. So, in, in, so in, in, you are telling us the principles are quite clear, but in practical terms, it's a bit more complicated. Yes, I mean, I think the the, the clearest practical case is uh, where resources have just been seized and taken, and 
still held by the, uh, the party that took them and is uh, needed by the other party, and that's fairly clear. But I think the, um, the much more difficult cases, which I think typically, are, I think colonialism um, is uh, typical here, really. The historical record is always going to be mixed. So colonialism is both beneficial and harmful Mm -hmm. to the societies colonized. And what that mixture is, how much benefit, how much harm, is what we argue about. And that's the yeah. difficulty, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm.